Hello, everybody, and welcome to another one of our discussions here. Today, we are with Juan Peralta. After graduating from Full Sail's Recording Arts program in 1996, Juan Peralta moved to Los Angeles and began his career as a mix technician and an assistant re-recording mixer. During the early years of his career, Juan had the opportunity to work on over 100 film, television, and game projects while learning from some of the best sound editors, designers, and re-recording mixers in the business. In 2008, after over a decade of working in more support-oriented positions on dub stages, he made the move to working as a re-recording mixer full-time. Since then, Juan has served as one of the primary re-recording mixers on projects that range in scope from animated adventures like Onward and The Grinch to Marvel superhero blockbusters such as Black Widow, Avengers Infinity War, and Endgame, and much, much more. He's also a two-time Golden Reel Award winner, one which was for sound editing on WALL-E, and was, also an and was also inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2013 here at Full Sail. Please welcome our friend and fellow Full Sailor, Juan Peralta. Hello, hey, everybody. How, how you doing, hey, how's Juan? It going? Good. Doing great, doing great. Good to see you, good to see you once again. Um, yeah. So for today, we're talking about film audio. So one of the big questions I, I know that is on my mind uh, is where, where we're headed as far as uh, surround formats and spatial audio, right? And that whole thing and 3D audio and immersive, are they all the same? Are they different? Where is it going? And where, how did we get here, right? Uh, from yeah. stereo to surround 5171. So um, more than, you know, you obviously choose what you'd like to discuss, but more than anything, I think uh, a little bit of uh, where we are now in the, in the industry and, and even post COVID and where, where you think we're headed. Um, as yeah. well for, for films and sound audio uh, or re-recording mix as well. So yeah. So when I when I uh, first moved to LA, um, the the uh, most dominant format was a, a Dolby stereo, which was basically your um, a stereo mix that uh, be, if you had a receiver at home that had a Pro Logic button, it would kind of decode it into like an LCR and a one mono surround. And since then, we're at um, a potential of 128 tracks for Atmos. So it's a huge, huge uh, jump um, from that Dolby Stereo. Instead of having a mono surround, we went to a split surround that became Dolby Digital and DTS. And then after that, uh, we went to 7.1. Instead of having two surrounds, now we have four surrounds and two sound fields, one sides and one rears. And, and it's just been growing until um, a few years ago. Um, uh, gosh, yeah, I guess it's probably been soon a good seven or eight years now since, full, since Atmos came out. And uh, Dolby's idea there was to... Um, this notion of object-based mixing and object-based panning and uh, be, having the ability to take one sound and put it in any one speaker in the room uh, discreetly. <clears throat> so that obviously was just added more and then also putting in ceiling speakers and you know it all sounded very like, whoa, what's going on? And, uh, but you know, Dolby did a good job at figuring out a way to make uh, contain it and uh it's made our jobs uh you, we can be a little more creative i guess and and try different things and move stuff around differently um i would say the biggest uh benefit that atmos gives um the movie experience is the fact that all the surrounds in those previous formats that i mentioned the stereo the 5.1 and the 7.1 were all band passed so those surrounds never really went down to any kind of frequency level that matched the front speakers because they were smaller speakers. So when Dolby introduced Atmos, they said, hey, let's go ahead and add some subwoofers just for the surrounds. And so whenever you pan a sound from the screen to the surrounds, you don't lose that low end energy that was there in front. So now what happens is when it goes to the surrounds, it'll play all that, all those lower frequencies will go to a sub to support those high frequencies in the surrounds. And now you have full range EQ, full range frequencies on all speakers. 
And that makes a huge difference more so than like, you know, ceiling speakers and, you know, being object based and all that. That's actually been the best thing. So the, the thing that's happened. And that's in, that, and that's Atmos only? What? Uh, that is Atmos what? only. That is Atmos only. Yeah. Um, wow. The one thing that, that has now, so this was pre, pre COVID, pre COVID. We're, we're mixing in Atmos and everything's great and everyone's having fun. And then the pandemic hits and then the theaters close and then streaming happens uh, to a probably a bigger push. Sure. Um, and so now we are, whereas all these movie theaters that upgraded to Atmos and added all these speakers and did all this stuff, um, now we have to deal with the fact that a lot of home theaters didn't do that right. so now what format should we mix in you know so that that that's been the tricky thing um there is the theatrical atmos that everyone goes to the theater you pay extra money i guess for that sometimes and sounds great it's huge it's big and it's fun home theater atmos is a different thing altogether it's not as powerful obviously they don't want people to like blow their speakers at home so things are are contained and compressed and all that so there's been a format basically or limit that um the streaming um providers have set for the audio so you know when whenever a movie came in during the pandemic we were like okay so is this for netflix or is this for the theater or you know what are we doing well, it's for both. I'm like, well, okay. So then we should mix in theatrical first and it's full blown thing. And then it's, it's always been the case where you want to mix your film in the, in the widest possible format first, and then go ahead and like narrow it down to all the way down to stereo. Um, so on, on, what, uh, on that point, sorry to interrupt, but on that yeah, point no, no, really no. quickly, um, do you, uh, do you do the, surround mix and then do a another stereo discrete mix or do you do them simultaneous okay so there are a couple schools of thought on that um like i said we like to do whatever the the, the biggest format first even if it was just seven one is going to be the, the largest one we'll start with the seven one and then go to a five one and then go to stereo every single one of those steps is a separate mix wow okay. so whenever um i do an atmos mix and I have 9.1 tracks. So that's 10 tracks of just the main bed, not including any objects that we made. And we can make dialogue objects, music objects, effects objects. What ends up happening is the Dolby, uh, this box called the RMU, mm -hmm. um, it can take those objects and basically render out a 7.1 and a 5.1 version of that pan in the room. So I take those objects, I do a render of that, and then I fold it in to that nine one that I'm gonna collapse down to a seven one. Then I take that, those objects and I add it in. And in some cases that panning um, is very uh, mathematically correct, but not Word. artistically correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I end up, you know, kind of trying to, you know, mold it a little bit better to what I would have done if it was only seven one. Like I don't have overhead speakers in seven one. So when I pan this, one ship over our head. Now it, it's mostly on the right side of the screen. Um, and when I go to seven one, why is it coming out of the left side? So I don't want that. So I, I, need I to start, start tilting yeah. over, you know, and you rework it a little bit. So mm -hmm. we do that for the seven, we do that for the five one. And then for the stereo, um, the Dolby stereo, that ProLogic thing that I talked about earlier, that's kind of gone away. And a lot of people are using their laptops, their phones, their, mm -hmm. you know, earbuds to listen to stuff. So in those cases, I like to make a nice clean stereo that has been, you know, contained and sounds good and not overloaded with like too much subwoofer feeding it and, you know, distorting and all that. So that's also a separate pass. And that would, would that be the same as what you would send to Netflix? Because, you know, people watching Netflix yeah. maybe watching yeah, yeah, yeah. all yeah. that. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We send it to Netflix. And Netflix is one of those few places that actually requires you to send a stereo mm -hmm. and a five on it. And because, you know, depending on your bandwidth, uh, the algorithm that Netflix has gives you the best possible audio. 
So if you have really high bandwidth and you have 4K, it's going to give you that Atmos. Got it. And if it detects Atmos on your receiver, if not, then it'll start folding down and whatnot. So, um, but they also put limits onto the peaks and how hot the level needs to be and all that kind of stuff too. So we also have to abide by those rules as well. So folding down, it doesn't really fold down the way that I'm thinking. It really just chooses the exactly the, yeah, the yeah, yeah stream yeah exactly so now there when are we think of folding down we think of kind of five one to stereo like fold down so i don't want to right. get anyway yeah 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 sure sure um but there are a couple other stream i don't know which streaming i don't know if it's hbo or whatever there are a couple other ones that do not require a stereo and they'll do that from the five one. they'll wow. just do that fold down so in those cases we have to listen we have the, the ability to take the five one and listen to what it would sound like in stereo on the dub stage, just to see how it's going. And if there's any adjustments we want to make to that. That's very cool. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's going it, right now. We're kind of in this gray area of, are we mixing for theatrical? Are we mixing for streaming? And now that the streaming services are like doing these day and date releases, of like, for example, Black Widow, I mixed that a year ago and I, I mixed it theatrically. And then we also, we were right in the middle of the pandemic. So obviously it wasn't coming out. So we ended up doing the home theater version of it. We did all the foreign language versions of it and we just did everything and just put it on the shelf. And, um, you know, they announced earlier this year that they were gonna do theatrical and the, the Disney plus premium um so it's interesting i think all the studios are trying to do this and they are kind of putting all their chips towards the streaming services um so i'm kind of in a we're in this mode where we're like what's going to happen or theatrical is it coming back is it not i mean with covid still kind of lingering around it's still hard to say uh but uh, uh, curiously, yeah. like there's like you were saying, there's more and more home at most systems. I mean, they're not really designed the same, right? Most of them are coming from you know the front and doing what yeah. it does. Yeah. Uh, for those, are you mixing specifically for that format? Given you know, given the, the popularity of of it right now, probably. Um, yeah. Or are you just doing at most the way you do at most for theater? Like, or do, do you even have the ability to? Um, kind of simulate what it might sound like from a home Atmos system on your dub stage. Yeah, yeah. So uh, at Skywalker, we have um, a dedicated room, just a small room okay. that is probably the size of a, of a good size living room. And we have all formats in there just for home theater. Mm-hmm. So we have the full blown setup of all individual speakers, ceiling speakers, the whole thing. Like if you were going to go buy a system, a home theater system that has Atmos where you, you know, mount those speakers on the ceiling. We right. have that. We <laughs> also have sound bars. Right. <laughs> have a sound bar that says Atmos on it and it shoots up and pull, goes down. We also have um, these tower speakers that also simulate surrounds by shooting to the ceiling and deflecting down. Uh, so, but having said that, we have all that. <laughs> um, mostly, mostly we have that just to check what it's going to sound like. But we predominantly mix for the best system that you can possibly find. Because it's too hard to start chasing down all these different formats and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I I imagine it's probably even more beneficial for some of your clients, even that room, because for you guys, you'd have to move into that. And you already know more or less how it should translate, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And then, you know, the one thing that I do when I'm, when I go from a theatrical to a home theater is I, I just remember the theatrical. I sit down in the home theater. These speakers are smaller. Um, the EQ of the room is slightly different and all that. And I'm just, I'm just there making sure that that movie that I did in theatrical is coming through in the, in, right. and all those low end hits and all those big moments where you want to feel something. I want to make sure you still feel that in the home theater. Very cool. Um, yeah, that's it's interesting stuff. It's it's far away from some of the places that a lot of this, like a lot of us are are coming from, um, just because of the the resources you have available. Um, without all of that, you know, do you find 
do you think like moving forward like i i recently heard that netflix is requiring atmos um for their deliverables um are you oh, yeah it's been like that for a while yeah so it's it seems like some of the things that you know a lot of the newer starting up freelance young people coming in could do from their home systems it's almost like surround was to a bunch of us back in the day when we were working in stereo. It was like, oh no, now we need to deliver a surround format, even though it was mono originally. Okay, we'll do surround. You know, and that was yeah. a requirement for for deliverables. Now, and that was you know moved us all really stayed in the studio world uh, along with the tape machines that we had to lay back to. Now the tape machines are kind of gone, which is great, and that opened up the market a lot for for independent work. Sure. Now moving with Atmos, or do you see that as kind of being another barrier of entry a little bit for newer people that don't do Atmos? Because it seems oh. like that's going to become a more predominant deliverable. Yeah, no, it's definitely going to be a thing. Um, the cool thing is, is um, if you invest in Pro Tools, which I know is a pretty pricey program, but that is basically the industry standard for Film Post. Yeah. Um, it is has now built into it without having to get plugins and without having to try to upgrade too much other than like some speakers and some amps. You can do a full 9.1 Atmos natively in Pro Tools now. So that aspect of it, of you have your own system, you got Pro Tools. If you have the speakers, you can make an Atmos. Yeah. You know, you don't have to like, you know, do all this crazy stuff. Um, Unfortunately, what you're still going to need is you're going to need some space in your room. Um, I mean, it doesn't need to be huge. Like uh, we have these um, smaller design and mix rooms at Skywalker that are um, basically like a bedroom, a little large, a larger bedroom, but it has a screen. It has small speakers. We have speakers on the ceiling and they're smaller, like, like almost um, commercial speakers you can just buy. And they translate pretty well as long, you know, the Atmos, as long as you tweak your room and you have it all kind of done, it should translate to the bigger rooms. Uh, but having said that, you have a computer at home, you have some speakers, you could start dabbling in that and playing around with that stuff. And, and the other thing that's, you know, it's not ideal, but depending on what you're working on, um, delivering an Atmos mix doesn't always need to have a lot of Atmos objects. Uh, yes. Right? So if you're working on something yeah. very simple, you really, yeah. you know, you can print out basically, you know, clear tracks for some of the Atmos stuff in your, sure. in your stems. It doesn't need to be filled with stuff. So if you don't have the best monitoring system, that's okay, yeah. right? Yeah, as yeah. long as you can deliver what they're asking for um, right. format-wise, which is cool. Yeah, that 9.1 is basically the, 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 the most important thing. The objects, okay, you made a couple objects, great. They're right. not, that's not the end all be all. It's that 9.1. Right. And, and now that Pro Tools has that 9.1 capability and it's just outputs and buses, you can just go ahead and do that. Yeah. Now, do the objects get printed down into the 9.1? Is that how that works? When, well, or is, it, for, like, <laughs> is it more complicated than that? <laughs> well, it's, it's just, a, it's kind of weird because the, the home theater version of Atmos it's just very limited. It's just not the same as the theatrical. The theatrical, you can make a 9.1 track, which will, takes 10 tracks, and you can print 118 objects and deliver mm -hmm. that to the theater, and that'll just play in all its glory. For the home theater, uh, because they don't have that capacity and that bandwidth, uh, especially for streaming through you know internet right. and all that stuff, they, they limit that um, object count down and then on top of that, they also do this thing where they cluster them and, and they kind of marry uh, whatever. If there's a few of them that are kind of doing the same movement, they kind of put those together. And, and it's a weird format. I think they call it 714. Yeah, I think I've seen that. So, yeah. So basically it's, um, it's your 7 one, yeah. uh, mm. your, your, your 7 one plus your sub, right? And then those right. four zones above you, those front, left, right, overhead and then rear left right overhead and then i don't know how it does it but it's just basically a little limited and in some cases if you have too many objects for the home theater it doesn't respond well so you have to kind of figure that out makes sense all right cool uh, there's uh two questions that came up um sure earlier on and and uh gonna jump into them because they may they may you know lead us into some other directions as well 
Um, <clears throat> the first question uh, from, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, Luis, uh, he says, hello, Juan, uh, thank you for this. Uh, what would you recommend to students who want to learn how to improve their skills in regards to audio editing? Uh, what steps did you take on your way to becoming an expert? <laughs> <laughs> expert, Do you think okay. you're an expert? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Every day, I, every time I go to work and I work on a new project, I learn something new. So I don't know yeah. that I'm an expert. Um, so uh, for, okay, so editing. Editing is a different beast than mixing. And, and I'll be honest, I've done a little bit of editing early on, but then I, I jumped over to mixing just because when I first started as a mixed tech, I was in a dub stage and that's all I ever knew. All I ever knew was big rooms, big screens, you know, the whole thing. And um so I did early on when I was uh, going to leave that mixed tech position, I dabbled a little bit with editing and, um, but then quickly realized, no, I, I know the mixing stuff. I really want to do that. So then I jumped over. So for editing though, um, <laughs> and this also goes for mixing and it's, it's kind of this motto that I have for doing sound for, for films. Um, you have to think about, what the director's intentions are always always figure out what the director's intention when you're when they give you the video of the film and they you know it's chopped up into reels and you work on reel one reel two reel three reel four until you get through the whole movie um i like to watch the whole movie from end to end first kind of get my head you know into the film and then i start to figure out what are the most important parts of the film? What, what is happening? What is this character going through? And every scene that's in that movie is there for a reason, right? So the picture editor and the director have spent a lot of time talking about what scene goes where and how it goes what. And so if you can, if you can kind of see that storyline go through as you're watching the film, then it should be, super obvious what sounds you need and what the, 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 the fabric of the sound is going to be. Um, if it's a sci-fi you know, film, then you know you're gonna do some high tech sounds and stuff like that. But you, know, you never wanna get in the way of a performance. You never wanna get in the way of a story point. You never wanna do anything crazy like that. Now, granted, there are gonna be some scenes where it's gonna be like, all right, go crazy here. You know, here you can do whatever you want. And so there you can, you know, you can take some freedoms, but um, for editing, I always am like, okay, is this a sad moment? Is this a happy moment? Is this, um, you know, a tense moment or whatever? And then that is going to determine what sounds I'm going to choose to put in this scene, you know, and I go by that and it, it holds up for every movie I've ever worked on. It really does. It's just like, if you can get into the head of the director and the picture editor and producers about what they are uh, trying to achieve and you just add those sounds to help support that vision, you're good. It's golden. Yes. I mean, you, it's very meticulous. Editing is very meticulous. It's like every tiny little detail you're trying to get or whatever. And in some cases, they can be rabbit holes that you go down that you just really don't need that. Sound. <laughs> like after a while, you're like, oh, I did this whole thing. Uh, we don't need that sound. We, this is the most important sound here. So let's work on the later. So that's the way I look at it, really. Yeah, I know. Um, <clears throat> I, I know that uh, I, I've heard you uh, talk one one time to students. I think it was uh, Hall of Fame a couple of years ago, maybe two years ago. And um, you were talking about mixing with Gary Rizzo, not with him, but you're in the same room with him. Mm -hmm. And you were like, I don't know about you, Gary, but you know, I, I, I like to do what's called additive mixing. And you went to the <laughs> console and you're like, I'll listen to one sound and then I'll take it down. I'll listen to the other sound, take it down. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I kind of like that. Maybe you know? and I'm sitting there watching this as someone that's, you know, more of an editor. And I, mm -hmm. I'm looking at it like, you know how much time and work went into each of those tracks that you're <laughs> yes. not just maybe listening to and maybe going to use. But the reality <laughs> is that as an editor, you're building the palette, right? The sound palette for the re-recording mixers to play with and to, right. to put where it needs to go. So the best advice I've always had for editors is don't take it personal when your stuff's yeah. not played in the final movie. 
right? Sure. Um, and when it is, take that as a huge compliment, right? Instead of the opposite, which is, wow, they took everything out and they just used one thing. You know, well, mm. cool. That's what they needed, right? And your right, job right, is right. to provide them all possible things that they may need with their clients when, while they're working. And that's that's what you're there for, you know? Right. Um, which kind of leads me to my next question, which is uh, from Rommel and, uh, and it's about Wally, which is what you won the Golden Reel Award for. And uh, he wrote, um, when he watched Wally, uh, he was taking audio uh, production uh, class at Full Sail, the depth of the audio detailing, it, it, it was it gave him a headache because it was so detailed. How long did it take <laughs> to edit the audio and how were you able to take it mentally? And at that stage, I think you were, um, were you assisting, I think? Yeah, no, I had or... just stopped assisting. I had just stopped assisting on the stages and I jumped over um, the supervising sound editor, Matt Wood, was a good friend of mine. I had did, I just finished doing this uh, Clone Wars um, uh, animated uh, show with him. And he said, hey, I need help doing Foley. Would you be interested? I said, yeah, sure, I'll jump on that. And that kind of was another stepping stone to get away from the uh, mixed tech position. Um, so <laughs> for Foley and for editing in general, it takes months for a film like that anyway. For a film with a, with a big budget like Wally and all these Marvel movies, you, we get typically four months to prepare the editing tracks. So you're going in every day working nine to 10 hour days and working on frame by frame. And, um, you know, you're just trying to, uh, to fill everything out. And um, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it looks, it, you know, the, the end result is like, oh my God, what, how did you, you know, this, but as you're working on it day and day and you're just building the layers, you know, it, 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 it's not a daunting task as, as it may seem in the end. Um, you know, you like one day I'm just, okay, I'm just going to do footsteps for this one pass. And so you work on all the footsteps and you get it in sync and you move it, you know, a couple frames here, a couple frames there, and all that stuff and, and getting the right footstep for, oh, that last one needs to be a bigger one. Let me swap that footstep out and do that, you know, and you work on it. And then, you know, next thing you know, by the end of the day, you've got almost halfway through the reel, if not more, you're like, okay, great. So tomorrow I'm going to finish up this and then I'm going to work on prop, you know? And so it's a slow kind of build. So it's not super like, you know, crazy, like, oh my God, there's no way I'm ever going to finish this. <laughs> so, yeah. It's also, um, you know, it's because you're working on teams, right? Like it, it's, you're not, I mean, I, I guess you're not right. hitting everything all at once. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. And there were two Foley editors on that show. So he actually took a couple, couple reels. I took a couple reels and then we'd swap and go over each other's reels and sit, you know, so, and then there's also people working on backgrounds and people working on sound effects. And then we all have lunch together and talk about a couple different things about, Hey, you know, on that scene, what are you going to do with the, is that a sound effect or should the Foley cover that or whatever? And then, you know, so it's a big team and there's a lot of people and everyone gets a good amount of time to work on it. So it's not, so uh, overwhelming you know cool <clears throat> so from uh from that if you wanted to talk a little bit about um the differences i know we've we've met we've kind of skirted around the difference between editing and mixing um mm -hmm. but really um the day-to-day -day differences the mentality differences the career path kind of differences and and because like let's say i'm a student graduating now and i may want to be a re-recording mixer i know that Mm -hmm. uh, if I would have known when I was graduating that if I wanted to be a recording mixer, I should go and work at dub stages instead of post houses, then I would mm -hmm. probably have done that. And I would right. have ended up in that direction instead of where I did. Um, and they are relatively separate. I don't know how separate they still are as far as the career paths. But like you mm -hmm. said, um, yeah. you, kind of, you kind of build your own future, right? Like the more jobs you take as an editor, the further away you get kind of from recording and vice versa. So if you want to yeah. go a little bit into that. Um, yeah, jobs, sure. And, and the mentality, I guess. So, um, like I said, when I, um, it's funny because when I graduated Full Sail and I moved to LA and I went to this one little post house, it was a really small place called EFX. And they, you know, they did some movies. They did some B-level movies. They did like The Mask and uh, Dumb and Dumber. Didn't David, and David, Farmer work, David Farmer worked there. David right? Farmer worked there. David Farmer worked there. Gary Rizzo mm -hmm. worked there. Mark Fishman worked there. I mean, it was kind of like this one, it, it felt like a postgraduate full sale um, audio post 
mastering <laughs> class right. or something because <laughs> you know we all work in there and um i was there when farmer was there when uh uh fishman was there still and there were a couple other full sale grads that were there as well and it was like the only place to go to in la when um you really didn't want to do music because to be honest with you when i went to full sail back in 96 it was very obvious that if you were going to full sail you wanted to be in music production you wanted to do, you know recording bands or you know rap you know all that stuff was huge and, and there was a very small group of us that wanted to do audio post so when i told you know that placement department that i really want to do audio post they're like okay well here's one place that has taken a lot of full sale grads and we know them well and you should go interview and i said okay so i flew out there i interviewed with mark fishman he he's like you're on you're in what do you want to do and i was like i don't know what i want to do i'll i'll be an assistant i'll do whatever you know and it just so happened that there was another full sale grad there his name was uh, marshall garlington and he was the main stage a mix tech and he got the opportunity to start mixing he had been on the dub stage for a few years now he was amazing at it and the original effects editor that was there got another job somewhere else so that chair became available so he was trying to slide into there um the other head mixer was uh, very um open to the idea of having marshall be there with him so uh that was the position that was available. They were like, okay, so we need somebody to work on the stage. And I didn't even know what it was. I and mean, I was just like, what? Uh, sure, okay, I'll do that. That one decision and that one position available has determined the rest of my career. It really was a chance thing. I could have been as easily been David Farmer's assistant and gone down the, the sound design path or effects editor or something like that. But it just so happened that was the position that was available. I took it. I learned so much about just creating the full soundtrack of it. Um, and that's one of the bigger differences is that, you know, as an effects editor or a Foley editor or a dialogue editor, you're focused on one thing for the whole film. And that is the big difference between an editor and a mixer. When I'm mixing, even if I'm only mixing sound effects, I still have to be aware of what's happening and what's coming out. There's dialogue, there's music, there's backgrounds, there's Foley. And it's the, it's the combination of adding all that stuff together that you start looking at everything as a big picture thing. You know, you, you have to look at the movie. You have to watch the movie constantly and kind of feel what the sound is doing, is it helping, is it not helping, is that too loud, is that distracting and whatever, which is when you're editing, you're just like, you're covering. You're just covering everything that's on screen. There's, okay, he's walking across the room, here's some footsteps, there's this, there's a car by that goes by, I'm gonna put that car by, you know, and you're just basically focused on one thing. So that's the biggest difference. Um, and when you're editing, you're going to be focused on one part of the film and you're it's a, it's a meticulous thing, it's also, very, um, it could be very frustrating because you're trying to find the right sound for something that's happening on screen. And finding the right sound um, in a library, and especially if that library is huge, is, it's a, that's a talent. That is a big talent. And it's something that comes with a lot of um, experience you start to know which is the good sound. You start to know what category you, you gravitate to and where you try to pick sounds from there and all that stuff. But, you know, you're, you're basically trying to build this one scene of the movie or one reel of the movie with just your sounds, just sound effects. So when you play it from head to, you know, top to bottom, and you're, not, you're, you're usually not playing it with the dialogue or not playing with the music because we don't even have the music yet. We don't have the music until we get to the final mix. We have some demos or something that the composer will send us, but the full blown music orchestra, orchestra with right. all the splits, we don't have that yet. Right. So we, we have an idea of what the music is gonna sound like, but that's not the real music. And so when it comes to mixing, now I'm sitting here and even though I start 
taking all the work that the editor has done and I start to create layers of everything, that doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna hear all that when we get to the final mix. Cause now we're adding dialogue on top of that. Now we're adding music on top of that. Now it's like, how are we living together? And so this one sound that you might have spent, you know, a long time on, unfortunately there's a big trumpet swell something in the music and it's a big moment that has to go, you know? And so I would say that's the biggest difference is that, you know, when you're editing, you're, you're focused and you're, you know, trying to create one thing. And when you're mixing, it's basically take a step back and listen to everything together. So, um, yeah, it all depends on like what, and, and the other thing that, that happens in, in, um, mixing is that you deal with a lot of personalities right so when you're editing you're in your room you're by yourself got your headphones on or you have some speaker set up and you're working all day you go out to lunch you come back you keep working and you're in your own kind of environment when you're on the dub stage now basically it's me and my mixing partner who's handling probably dialogue and music and i'm handling everything else and then behind me is the director, is the picture editor, is the producer, is, you know, the post-production supervisor. Everyone has an opinion, everyone has an idea, and you're trying to walk this line of, what would you like, what would you, oh, okay, so maybe we can compromise and do that, you know? And so it's a very social and very um, subjective process. So, it, you know, those are the personalities you have to, you have to feel like, do I like working by myself? Yeah, I, I don't want anybody, you know, talking to me. You should be an editor. <laughs> or right. if you're like, exactly. I'm, I'm part of a team. Let's let's get this going. Like, okay, so maybe mixing might be a, a better path. Now, to do this, I know we had talked earlier about what's the best route. Like, do we want to go to a big place or do we want to go to a smaller place and, and you know, or, or work with some up and coming directors and stuff. And there, you know, it all depends on, like, are you trying to, are, what route are you trying to go? Are you trying to go the documentary route and you love documentaries and you want to do stuff like that or you love small films and you love, you know, little things like that, then maybe you go and you just try to get a relationship with directors and stuff and try to build soundtracks for them, you know. And I have a couple friends like that that live up here in the Bay Area. Um, they worked at Skywalker, but they were like, you know what? I, I really love working on indie films. I really do. And so he basically got a Pro Tools rig, got a little studio at home set up, and he's been working. And it's been, I mean, I don't know financially how well it's going, but he's surviving and he's doing, you know, and he's doing what he loves. Um, then there's the other route of go to a big facility, learn from people that have a lot of experience and wait for that opportunity to be able to move up into it. And that might take some time. You know, you have to be patient in, in those cases, but you know, two schools of thought there. Yeah. Um, there was a question asking uh, where are you from? Where are you from originally? Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder, I wonder if that has to do, the question has to do something with, um, you know, moving to LA right after school and supporting yourself, you know, that's not easy. Right. And I don't know if that's where the root of the question is, but um, sure. that's kind of where I'm taking it is, you know, if I yeah. were moving today to LA um, and I want to work at a big facility and I want to go through that and I want to give it the time, you know, you know uh, it's, it's not easy, but like, you know, but like yeah. you said before, it's, it's one of those where you just, um, you know, you, you can, you can do it either route and just kind of get by. It's not like you're making a lot in those uh, starting mm -hmm. positions of the big companies too. Um, but it's, uh, definitely, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> struggle, right. To, to move yeah. away from, from home and, and figure this out. Totally. Totally. So, um, I'm originally from New York. My parents are from the Dominican Republic and, um, I actually lived down there for a while, went to school down there and then came back to Florida, went to, um, UCF for a while and realized, you know what, I don't know if I want to do this. And uh, I actually went and talked to the, the placement people at UCF and they were like, what do you like to do? What do you like? What, you know, and we started talking and, you know, it, it became obvious that I liked movies and I liked sound and like music and all that. And they're like, you know, there's a studio called Wholesale right down the street. You should probably check them out. 
on University Boulevard. I was like, okay, yeah, sure. I'll drive down there and check it out on my way home. And I went in and I was like, okay, this is it. I'm done. I, this is where I want to go. And, you know, I went to my mom and I was like, look, they have financial aid. They could do this whole thing. This is what I want to do. And she was like, okay, this is what you want to do. And you know, she helped me out. Um, and I did it. So um, once I graduated, like you said, it was not easy to just go to LA and start working. Um, I basically, that first three months at, at EFX was a unpaid internship. I don't know if that flies nowadays, <laughs> but back then it was like, uh, I would call my home, I'd call my mom at home in Florida while I was in Burbank. And I would say, hey, can you sell my TV and my <laughs> stereo and send me that money? And so when we moved to LA, it was four full sale grads. One of them, their parent, his, his parents helped them out and helped them get into a one bedroom apartment. The other three of us crashed at his place for a year, just trying to make it. We got two from the video and film and two from audio. Um, my buddy who was in the audio program with me in my same class and everything, when we both graduated, we went to LA um, and he went the route of music and I went the route of post. And there were a good five months, I never saw him. We lived in the same place. Yeah, it sounds I, like my I story, had, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I slept in the corner of the living room, like I would roll out this little bed and like sleep there or whatever. And I, I would wake up at, you know, seven, eight, take a shower, get ready, go to work, be there by nine. And he would be asleep. And then when I got home, he was already gone. So he worked all night and I worked all day and I never saw him, you know. The other two guys that were with us were in, in, in film and video and they were they had jobs at like eFilm and at like MTV and doing some video editing stuff and be assisting some guys. And so we had more of a, a regular schedule that you know, was comparable. I saw them more often, but it was hard. It was hard. It was not like just, oh, just go to LA, got a job and that was it. It was, you know, it was great. No, it was like, there was a lot of peanut butter and jelly. There was a lot of ramen. There was a lot of, you know, doing <clears throat> what, stuff what, like that just to get in. When you're talking, it hits me uh, really, really hard how important it is to, because the same skill sets that helped you to be a decent assistant in the beginning and to, to get your footing in there also helped you to be in Los Angeles to some extent, because when I'm thinking about it, I also was crashing on someone's floor in New York city for six <laughs> months. Um, but I found ways to prov provide value. Even if it wasn't mm -hmm. money, I would find ways to provide value for them in some way mm -hmm. so that they enjoyed me around. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it's the sure. same thing with assisting. I mean, it's, it's very similar to some extent that, you know, being a good person and just being able to find things that need to be taken care of and just taking care of it, not asking all this mm -hmm. stuff. Those are mm -hmm. really good things to yeah. develop. And that's, I think, why so many people that are, you know, social uh, and can, can work that um, are able to do well as assistants and then move into, into roles in yeah. this um, as well. Uh, we got sure. two, two questions here. I wanted to run, run across you um, okay. from uh, Eduardo. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, he was just in my class a, a few, a uh, few months ago and a uh, really <laughs> good guy. Um, just like a few of these guys uh, that have already spoke, but um, he said that he came here to, to do music, right? Like a lot of us. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's pretty good at it. He's gotten it done for years now, but over time, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, um, he's learned audio post more and interested in it now. And, and he wants to continue that career path, but he also wants to work on music. So the question really is, do you think a person can still create his or her own content and work for a big project studio on films at the same time? And I'll, I'll let you answer, but I, I have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, okay. So the, the reality of it is that we all need to live and we all need to survive. We all need a job. Right. And so do you want to, what, you know, you want to pay the bills. Are you going to pay the bills by just making your own music? You'd have to get a break or something and or you have to get somebody who says yeah let's you're great let's go ahead and do and sign you you know do this all this stuff and so that's harder to get by than it would be to go get a job 
that can support you first and then you can do the music thing on the side or you know simultaneously but as long as it doesn't get in the way of your job that's paying the bills and you know helping you survive so what i've seen happen for people that are um that do that love to do music and they actually get into post production they go the route of the music right because obviously post has the, the one the most important thing is the music you know we got they're hiring composers they're hiring uh, music producers who are picking songs and, and and there's legal involved for paying artists to play their song in the movies and it's it's, it's huge department in in the post world and um, so one of the things I've seen is that a lot of musicians who have a real passion to create music end up going and uh, trying to work with composers that work on films and maybe get in there like as an assistant or a runner or something just to get started and then you know say oh yeah i know a little bit of music whatever next thing you know you're you're maybe you're on a session where they're recording the um the orchestra and you can like you know just do some cue sheets or something or or help you know with the headphone setups and the microphone setups and stuff like that and you know work your way that angle um to either uh assisting that composer in a way or you can also go the route of editing the music because granted, right. you know, there's all these scores are being written for these films, but we chop that up. I mean, mm -hmm. there is someone who is called a music editor who's on the dub stage on the final mix who represents the music department and represents the music itself because the composer is never there. The composer is already working on another film while we're finishing yeah. the one he did previously. And so he's there to kind of make sure that the composer's vision is still there and still works and all these edits and these cuts are musically correct and or if if this whole long queue needs to be shortened what's the best way to shorten it they are in charge of doing that so it, it in a way i feel like it kind of feeds that music love that you have even though maybe you didn't create it yourself you're still taking ownership of it and you're still kind of like this is what the the composer intended and so that job is is, is a very important job in post and it might be another way of, of doing it. Or, you know, you go down the route of you want to compose and you find some indie guys that, you know, because music is super expensive. Um, you could you could probably say, hey, I, I would love to, you know, do something for you. Here's a demo of my music. Let me know if it'll work for your film. You can go that route too. But, you know, it all depends on your financial situation. Can you survive doing that? Or can you, you know, be an assistant first? Yeah, it's... It's good stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it, one thing that I keep hearing, and I, I mean, I think it's important to kind of point out is that the decisions you make as far as the, the, the positions you decide to take really dictate your, your future, you know? Yeah. So it's a lot of times I'll hear students be like, oh, I'll do anything as long as I can get a gig in audio. And, <laughs> and I remember saying the same thing and then yeah. very quickly being put into something that I was like, wow, I didn't realize I'd get pigeonholed in this that quick. And this is now what mm -hmm. I do. Like, that's who I am. Right? right. And it really does kind of happen that way. So it's, it's kind of important to know where you want to go and, and, mm -hmm. pick, and pick positions and opportunities that will lead you there and not kind of away because they all sound like they might lead you there, but like, you're, right. you know, like you said, sometimes they'll kind of go in different directions. Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, that's exactly how I got where I am today. It was like, I was just thrown onto a dub stage and that's all I knew. So there I am. Um, the other thing is, um, whatever job you do get, let's say you get a job that, and you're doing the job and you're like, well, you know what, this is quite for me, you know, um, but it's paying the bills and I'm going to keep doing it because I'm in audio post. The best way to not get pigeonholed or, or to, to set, to be like, you know what, I really want to do that job over there. The best way to move on is to do the best job you possibly can at the job that was given to you, create that, those bonds with those people and you know, have a good rapport with them and have a good relationship with them. And then after you've done it for a while and you know you're good at it and everything, and now you've, you've, you've met a lot of people and go to that supervisor and be like, hey, can I get a shot at doing that? I really, really wanna do it. They'll be like, oh, of course, you're the, like the, one of the best assistants. Yeah, sure, here you go. There's a little side project here. Why don't you work on that? You know, and that happens a lot. It's it's 
you know, it, it's just a way that people grow and people move into the direction they want to go. But first, you really have to kind of put in your time at whatever you were hired for, show your passion, show your professionalism. And then once you've established those relationships, then, you know, start knocking on doors and start doing things. Now, <clears throat> would you, um, we got a question for Brian, would you, would you recommend uh, starting to take internships or looking for internships while, while in school um, to kind of prepare that way or, or no? Mm. Yeah, it's hard. It's really hard, especially if audio post basically is LA. I mean, it's, it goes hand in hand. There's some in New York, there's, it might be a little bit in Atlanta, but nothing to the, to the, you know, yeah. as much as there is in LA and to be in LA, you really kind of have to have some type of support system because it's expensive. Um, it's hard. It's competitive. You know, um, there, there's a big push that's happening right now to, to try to get more people in internships and stuff. And that actually, there's been a lot of virtual internships too that are happening to help with that because I think all the studios are aware that it's like, you know, there's, you know, the one thing that COVID brought along now was like a diversity push, right? It was a big diversity push in post and all the filmmaking. And it's not just um, race, it's also gender and all that. So, um, so now there, there, there are a lot more opportunities as far as like a virtual internship or, um, so I even know that of some studios that are, pay, are, are helping people paying their, helping them pay rent or helping them, you know, survive for at least six months as a, as a grace period thing. That's great. So it, it's a, it's a pretty decent time. It's kind of, I'm not sure where to go or where to, you know, exactly to find those things, but I know it's happening. Um, so, uh, I, I kind of feel like internships should happen after because you they're going to expect a lot from you. And if you're in, still in school, there's not a lot of time to do both, you know. So I kind of feel like you, you, you can probably set those relationships up, relationships up while you're in school and say, hey, I graduate this day. Can I start interning for you this day? I mean, that you should start doing when you're in school. But the actual internship program itself, you should probably be more available. Yeah, it gets kind of complicated with, with yeah. our schedules and month by month sometimes. And, you know, you think you've got it down with the internship and then like the class structure changes. Now you got to tell the teacher if you could change your schedule. And then you yeah. kind of like kind of like marginalizes yeah. both things like and, and yeah. now you have no yeah, yeah. focus. So, yeah, if you can pull it off. Great. I, I know yeah. it's rare if if at all. And Orlando's not swimming with great internship opportunities in post right. specifically. There are really none. I mean, so right. it's. Yeah, I mean, I, I get it. Um, yeah. What, another question here from Matt uh, Miller. Um, what are some other limitations when mixing for streaming services? For instance, music, uh, there is a loss in quality when streaming. Um, how do you overcome the obstacles of losing certain things in streaming? I know we talked about this a little bit earlier mm -hmm. with, uh, mm -hmm. with the different, um, uh, you know, uh, delivery um, and mixing for each specific one. But do you have any other... Uh, major things I know you're saying you know you lose certain things like some yeah and, yeah yeah the, the biggest thing that I that um, hurts the most is the dynamic range you know you go and when you're watching a film in the movie theater you know it goes from quiet to super loud and everyone's like oh my god and you know and that is the um, the reaction that you're trying to get from the audience and stuff and then when you go to a streaming service um, the limitations that uh, Netflix and Disney plus and all those guys put on it's basically we want you to stay within this zone here. <laughs> so right. the lows don't go as low as they should. And the highs don't go as high as they should. Everything's kind of compressed. And so that, you know, is kind of a bummer. Um, but we try to make it work. It, it's a limitation. You know, it's just the numbers we have to hit. We have to actually hit some numbers. We can't have peaks above a certain you know, thing. And so um, unfortunately, it is what it is. You can't you know, the, um, sometimes the low end isn't as, as responsive as it is in a big theater because you got behind the screen, there's like 12 subwoofers, you know, and at home you have one, maybe two, you maybe, know, so maybe one, maybe, <laughs> maybe one, one maybe one. <laughs> right. So, um, so th there are definitely some limitations, but at that point, when you're doing it, it's like your hands are tied. You're like, yeah. I can't do anything about it. As far as quality goes though, um, the music and, and, 
Um, I mean, the bit rates are still kind of high. We're still working at 48, you know, K. And so the quality is still good. I, th I feel like the more the limitations are more about playback and, and, you know, what people have and what are their speakers any good or, you know, that right. kind of stuff. I know in the early days of surround, we used to put uh, the, the dialogue in the left center and the right, just in case the people who at their home didn't have a strong uh, center speaker, right? Right. So yeah, put yeah. It in the left and right too, just in case, you know, That's they right. wouldn't be able to hear the dialogue. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Uh -huh. And don't put it in the surrounds because nobody has surrounds. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, the last, uh, last question, unless we have additional time that I'm not aware of, but um, last okay. question is an interesting one and you may or may not have feedback on it, but it's basically about international students. And uh, okay. number one um, in my head would be, you know, working in LA, you know, interning in LA as a foreign student, an international student or international graduate, I should say, may be difficult. Um, Lucas is actually asking a little different question in that um, he wouldn't mind, he would like to work with posts from Los Angeles, but living in a different country. So two sides of the same kind of question, like uh, mm -hmm. he wants to work on Hollywood style projects. Um, uh -huh. Is it possible from somewhere else, right? Is, is there outsourcing of say editorial to, you know, oh. another country? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, um, okay. You know, and, or, or the other question is, if I stay here and I'm not, you know, a citizen, how is that working these days? Or do you know anything about sure. that? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so. Um, I've only had uh, one experience with um, a USC grad who, she was from China and um, she did an internship at Skywalker Sound and uh, she did a great job. She was really smart, really, uh, really got into it. And Skywalker actually did help with a visa and stuff like that to keep her on board. And she's still here, she's still here with us. That's one, <laughs> that's just one instance, you know, in the last however many years. Um, the other route would be, so it's possible. It, it's possible if you, if you go to a studio in LA and you make an impression and, and you are like, wow, this person really knows what they're doing. They're passionate. They're good listeners. They, everything we ask them to do, they do it correctly. They ask the right questions. The studio might help you out. Okay. But, you know, that, like I say, it, it's, it's kind of rare. The other, there is another aspect of it where if you're in a foreign country and you still want to work on these big movies, there is what we call the localization of the films. Right. So great. great. Um, there, yeah. So there's foreign language versions of every movie that Hollywood does. Right. And depending on the studio, they go all out. Like Disney mm -hmm. does close to 30 languages per movie. And the way that's done is they go to those countries, they hire a studio and they hire mixers and they hire editors, they hire uh, ADR producers who are now gonna revoice and they're gonna cast these movies in those languages with stars from that country mm -hmm. Right. So it's like a whole production for the same movie that you worked on in Hollywood. You know what I mean? So in Hollywood, we got, you know, we're doing Onward and we did, um, you know, Chris Pratt and Tom Holland and those guys. And then when it goes to, for example, for Spain and the, and the Spain, you know, Spanish, now they're going to get their bigger name, name Spanish actors to voice those characters. Well, all that needs to kind of get mixed in to the film. Now, when you're doing that, all you're really working on is the dialogue portion of the film. When I finish mixing a, a Hollywood movie, I deliver what's called an M&E. And the M&E is music and effects only. And so that way, when it goes to a foreign country, they get all their actors to do all the lines and do everything. Then you take that whatever M&E format you're doing, I can make a 7-1, a 5-1, an Atmos M&E, whatever. You're going to take that fresh dialogue and now you're going to mix it into the movie. You have all that stuff there kind of just sitting there at zero, right? The dialogue and the music of the whole movie. And now you're going to try to mix in this new foreign language dialogue. And, and that happens 
abroad, right? That that that, that happens the abroad. Mixing, the mixing happens in the localization abroad. process. Yes, yes, absolutely. It doesn't come back now, to you. Yeah. It doesn't, no, 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 it doesn't come no. back to me. All I do, all I'm in charge of is creating M&E. an M&E yeah. that, mm-hmm. and I ship that and then it goes. Yeah. Now there are some studios that have like one main studio in like London, for example, or something. And then they hire these people from other, from those specific countries to come in and be interpreters, make sure they're saying it correctly, you know, record all the ADR and all that stuff. So that's also another way. But then there are also companies that actually have studios in every single one of those countries and they are in charge of making the foreign language version for that film. Yeah, I I know that. Yeah, that's another option. It's a good one. Uh, It's a good one to remember, especially for international, because there is, um, you know, it's a booming industry as far as uh, we've never in the history of television and film thought we would localize films to this extent but with the technology we have and the ability we have i mean there's production companies all over in in little countries that are doing great work um yeah and it's it's great i mean we can see it ourselves when we watch any foreign films on netflix or foreign you know foreign tv shows that have the overdubbing some of them are great some of them are terrible right Right. and and that's (laughs) that's the gig right and and the better you are at that the more you're going to be sought after so it's it's a really good thing to remember especially if you're not able to stay here in this country and you yeah, want to work exactly uh, work and you're still working on the same movie yeah totally awesome really yeah. cool um until we get kicked out of here i got one question from okay. daniel <laughs> the music that is sent to you it's in stereo or 919 or 51 uh or they send it all in these formats i guess it, it well you go ahead but that really depends right i mean yeah that's the scoring okay so the um yeah the score depends on what composer yeah, yeah depends on what composer um is hired for the film um, some composers are really into Atmos and they'll send us a seven one um, of the whole orchestra already mixed down. They'll send us um, seven one. When I say seven one, it's seven one splits. So I'll have strings, I'll have drums, I'll have, um, you know, woodwinds, I'll have, you know, pads and all that stuff. And then he'll also send me um, four microphones that were in the room at the time for overheads and give me those microphones separately so I can put them in, in, in any certain spot to create a bigger right. space. So it all depends. I mean, we get, sometimes we get five, one splits. Sometimes we get seven, one splits. Uh, it's all very, you know, composer dependent and how savvy they are with it and stuff like that. And sometimes they send us a five, one and we're doing it at most. So now it's up to us to kind of like, all right, let's spread this out. I'll put the strings here and this over here, you know, the drums, leave them on the screen. I'll, I'll take the harp and I'll just kind of move it in the surrounds, you know, and then you get to play a little around that kind of stuff, but yeah, all kinds of formats. 